Emmett and People Land. Exterior, Venice Beach, Boardwalk, Montage, Day. Shots of Venice Beach. The Boardwalk, the Bike Path, Bathers, Volleyballers, the Shops, Freaks Museum, Pop Doctors, T-Shirt Shops, etc. Sound, notebook pages being leafed through. Here, February 11th. I had a hole in my left sneaker. I wrote it down. I keep a journal because things happen that are not my fault. So I keep a journal. I also cut articles out of the newspaper, so when they come to put me away for being crazy, I got proof it's not me that's insane. Exterior, Venice Beach, Boardwalk Day. Close up, a worn through hole in the bottom of a very worn out sneaker hole. The worn out hole looks exactly like Abraham Lincoln's profile on the US penny. It looked exactly like Abraham Lincoln. A hand inside the shoe sticks a finger out the hole in the sole and wiggles it. And the next day was February 12th, Lincoln's birthday. It's Emmett's hand inside the shoe. He shows it to Rusty, an 18-year-old female beach bum surfer and her 18-year-old quiet, cool, mysterious boyfriend, Dee. She examines the hole. Yeah, kinda. She shows it to Dee. He nods, yeah. It's an omen. How do you know? Tomorrow's Lincoln's birthday. Emmett, it's just a hole in your shoe. I know an omen when I see one. A Lincoln convergence. It's big. Emmett. Very rare. <laughs> You're crazy. Another tool in the toolbox. Sound off screen, cell phone rings. Hey, Carmella. What's up? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Emmett inserts a folded piece of newspaper into his shoe, covering the hole from the inside. Oh, no. What happened? Are you serious? Oh, no, Carmela, you, you did it! Well, where are you now? Okay, stay right there. I'll be right there. No, no, I'll come to you. Don't worry. She hangs up. That was Barney's mom. She's at Sybil's. I gotta get over there. I'll, I'll meet you back at the apartment. Emmett, can you take me to Millwood and Lincoln before she freaks out and leaves? Please? What was that all about? She works as a maid, and the woman she works for accused her of stealing her diamond ring and called the cops right in front of her. I meant the oh no you didn't part. She left. She's hiding at her daughter's friend Sybil's. Oh man, why'd you do that? Did she take it? I didn't ask. Don't matter now. Exterior, Breezeway Alley, traveling, day. Emmett rides his battered bike down the service alley behind all the boardwalk t-shirt, restaurant, and jewelry clothing stores along the Venice bike path boardwalk. Rusty stands on the rear axle footrest behind Emmett, hands resting on the back of his shoulder. He turns left, inland, into Venice Boulevard. Exterior, Venice Boulevard, traveling, continuous. Emmett's sneaker is still pedaling. Rusty's worried. Emmett's worried. Is she here legally? I guess. I don't know. I have a history of deep, mainly self-inflicted wounds and the execution of good intentions and helpful deeds. Exterior, Venice Boardwalk, Service Alley, Traveling Day. Emmett and Rusty ride past rear entrances of Boardwalk stores, parked cars, dumpsters, etc. Doing the right thing and aiding and abetting are not necessarily mutually exclusive. They ride along. I've been working and living here for about a week. Exterior, an old one-story gray Venice bungalow day. It's on a street lined with working-class Venice single and double-family bungalows and two-story apartment buildings. I live in, huh, I lived in a lovely guest house in the back. This is my son. He's in college now. Interior, Sybil's very small bedroom, day. Insert, on a smartphone, a photo of a smiling Mexican teenage boy wearing his graduation robe. I was born in Lodi, California. I'm a natural-born American citizen. So was he. Carmelo Suarez, 40, sits on the bed of the small bedroom. 20-year-old Sybil, a friend of Carmela's daughter, and Rusty. Sybil's not present. Carmela's still wearing her house clothes from work and is showing the smartphone photo to Rusty and Emmett. Emmett looks, gives a thumbs up, and goes back to simply listening to Carmela's story. He seems fascinated by her. But my father recently came into this country illegally and contacted me several times. The police might be able to track him down if I were taken into custody. Deport him, deport me. Carmilla, no, they can't do that. Can they? I'm at trucks. Well, well, they can't. But now they can shoot you as a fugitive of justice. I'm sorry. I was so angry. I freaked. Whatever. We gotta get you a lawyer and you gotta turn yourself in. Did you take the ring? Rusty, I didn't. I swear, I'm... I'm a professional. I work there. I, I'd be the first one anyone would suspect, like right now. She smiles at Emmett. There was the smell of red flags all over this. Well, do you know who did? No. Emmett watches Carmela talk to Rusty. MOS as 
But see, this time I had a hole in the bottom of my left sneaker that looked like Abraham Lincoln. And the next day was his birthday. A DBO, definite blatant omen. On the eve of a Lincoln convergence, one has invincibility for the next 24 to 72 hours. Do you know anyone who could have, might have, maybe, possibly, somehow, weird, wild guess done it? <clears throat> Exterior, front gate of a gated and walled Bel Air mansion, day. An old, closed van pulls up and stops in front of the gate. Three people are in the front seat. 18-year-old, upscale male, Zachary, Zach Blackstone, is wedged between the driver, 28-year-old Eddie Street, and his buddy, 25-year-old Chooch. Chooch gets out. Zach gets out holding a backpack in one hand. Chooch gets back in. Two young neighborhood boys, Robbie, 10, and Jason, 12, skateboard down the street, passing Zach. Hey, Zach. Hey, Robbie. The two kids continue on by. Monday, 3 p.m. Don't get lost. I'm going to the desert for the weekend. This stays right here. I'll be back Sunday afternoon. My contact picks it up Sunday night. Right here. This isn't going anywhere. Monday at 3. We don't send letters. We come by. The van drives away and Zach walks to the closed entrance gate. Interior van continuous. That kid's your call, man. Yeah, you and him both. Exterior. Front gate of a gated and walled Bel Air mansion day. There's a Lamborghini sports car parked haphazardly in the parking area inside the gates. He searches his pockets, then dials the gates voice phone. Yes? Hey, Mom. I left my keys in the house. Hi, love. I thought you were going to leave at 10. I'm a little behind. Some friends came by. I'm leaving right now. I just got to drop off some stuff. I've got an awards dinner Sunday night. I'll see you Monday. Drive safe. Love you. As Zach is buzzed in, a small black dog, Casey, runs up to the gate, ready to run out. Come on, Casey. Jeez, get back. Go back. Zach fends him off enough to slip in and close the gate behind him. Come on, let's go. Casey obediently follows Zach towards the front door. Casey slows, looks back to the gate, then follows Zach. Interior, Veronica Blackstone's, Mrs. B, home office. Posters and pamphlets, Veronica Blackstone for city council, of various sizes are scattered about. Her home office is in the middle of Mrs. B's run for city council. One of her campaign aides goes over some lists while another aide answers a call. Veronica Blackstone, Mrs. B, 45, sits at her desk, angrily ranting, MOS, about something to Terence Torrance, 35, well-dressed. Solomon Toast, 29, a black American, better dressed, sits and listens, obviously, with Mrs. B. The ring was Mrs. Blackstone's great-grandmother's diamond and ruby-studied wedding ring. Her great-grandmother was part of the next-to-last Tsar of Russia's court. The ring was a museum piece worth a quarter of a million dollars. She wore it for the first time the night before the robbery, part of some publicity gala for a ballet and a disease. I understand. All we're saying is the particular policy you have does not cover domestic help theft. Mrs. B is silent. We should continue this conversation when Mrs. Blackstone has time to go over the documents. We're in the middle of a campaign. It's a little hectic at the moment. Of course. I understand. Thank you for your time. At your convenience. Mr. Torrance gets up and leaves. I have to give a major campaign speech in two hours, and I'm told my quarter million dollar diamond and ruby ring is not insured? What the fuck is going on? Hey, hey, hey. It's a distraction. You're doing great. Your numbers are holding. Just stay on message and you're home free. It's yours to lose, so don't. See you there. See you later. He leaves. Veronica gets up. I'm going up to take a shower and get ready. She exits. God damn it! Interior, second floor hallway landing. Mrs. B comes up the stairs and walks to an open door off the hallway and enters. Casey! God damn it! Interior, Mrs. B's bedroom. Casey the dog is on the bed. He jumps off, runs out of the bedroom, stops in the hallway, turns and looks at Mrs. B, looking back at him from the bedroom. Oh, damn it, Casey! What did Mama tell you? Casey calmly listens as she stands in the bedroom and rants out at him. Cute and constipated doesn't cut it around here anymore, mister. That comforter cost $1,000 to dry clean. You're not allowed upstairs until you poo. Outside, and you know it. Now get downstairs. Now, damn it. Casey calmly gets downstairs. Interior, Sybil's bungalow living room, evening. Carmela has prepared a meal for Rusty, Dee, Sybil, and Emmett. Who else has access to the house besides you and Mrs. Blackstone? The gardener, the cook, and her son, Zachary. 
Miss Blackstone's husband passed away several years ago. And where is Zach now? He's staying at his friend's house in the desert for the weekend. He'll be back Sunday afternoon. Zach stole his mom's ring to get money to buy equipment and or drugs for the van. Duh. Well, I could search his room tonight and find clues. Maybe even the ring. It's possible. Of course it's possible. It's called breaking and entering. It's a big deal crime, Emmett. You don't have to do this for me. It's dangerous. It's for the greater good. Well, I'm due at work in a half hour. If I miss work once more, I'll get fired. Tomorrow I get off at five. Cops might compromise the crime scene. Gotta be tonight. It's okay, I'll go solo. Emmett, you'll get busted alone. I can do this. Carmela, tell her I can do this. He can do this. Exterior, inside the walled grounds of Mrs. B's is <coughs> night. The two prongs of a leaning ladder are propped up from the other side. Emmett appears, climbs up onto the wall. Jump cuts in fast motion. He pulls up the ladder, sets it down on the inside. Climbs down into the yard, hides the ladder under some bushes. He heads for the house. Exterior along the side of the house, night. He sneaks towards the back along the side of the house in the dark. Freezes, listens. Slowly backs onto a rake lying on the ground. Whack! The rake handle springs up, whacks him in the back of his head. Dazed, he turns around and steps forward. Whack! The rake handle rises and hits him again, this time in the middle of the forehead. He falls, unconscious. Crossfade two. Exterior, Pacific Palisades, California, sunrise. Aerial view of Pacific Palisades. Exterior, alongside Mrs. B's mansion, sunrise. Emmett's curled up, asleep in the dirt in the same spot he recently knocked himself unconscious. A recently planted flower bed of bulbs next to the house, off to the side of the second floor balcony. The rake is nearby. Casey the dog walks up and starts licking Emmett's face. Emmett opens his eyes as Casey continues. Hi, you must be the dog. Casey reacts positively. Emmett props himself up. Casey, sit. Definitely the dog. This is for Carmella. Emmett pulls out a hot dog from a plastic baggie, tears off a piece, and gives it to Casey. Casey gulps it down. If you stay cool, there's more. Deal? Emmett repockets the rest. Casey runs away, returns, drops a red ball in front of Emmett, and sits, wagging his tail. Emmett picks up the ball, throws it as far as he can. Casey eagerly runs after it, and Emmett leaves in the opposite direction. Exterior, rear of house, early morning. Emmett arrives at the rear of the house and tries the kitchen door. It's unlocked. He enters. Interior, top of rear stairs landing, continuous. Emmett sneaks up the back stairs to the landing with a piece of paper in his hand. Insert, a crude map of the house with Zach's room labeled. Emmett walks to a room with an open door. He peeks in. Interior, Zach's room, morning. A neat freak, sophomore male, UCLA business major's room at home. Perfectly clean, neat, folded, hung, ironed, and at right angles. There are also many hand-painted troops of 18th century tin soldiers around the room. Two rows of Prussian soldiers along the edge of the bookshelf full of books. A battalion of British soldiers on an entire bookshelf section. Emmett steps in, goes right to the tin soldiers on the bookshelf, picks one up, and examines the hand-painted detail. Sound off screen, a dog bark. Emmett turns. Casey drops the red ball in front of Emmett and wags his tail. Interior, Mrs. B's bedroom. Mrs. B is in bed with a sleep mask over her eyes. Casey, if you didn't poo outside, I'd better not catch you upstairs. I mean it. Interior, Zach's room. Casey picks up his red ball and hurries out of the room, followed by Emmett. Interior, upstairs hallway. Casey and Emmett quickly disappear down the back stairs. Interior, upstairs hallway. Mrs. B comes out of her room and heads down the hall. Interior, Zach's room. Mrs. B passes the doorway, looks in, no Casey. Continues on, comes back, looks, and sees the tin soldier Emmett was holding laying on the floor. She enters, picks it up, and returns it to its empty space in line, and notices something strange. A false set of book spines behind the line of tin soldiers. She carefully lifts it up and out over the tin soldiers to see a hollowed out space stuffed with a five pound clear plastic baggie of pure white powder. Oh, Zachary Love, you stupid little thieving bastard. No. No, goddammit, I worked my ass off. Sound off screen, her cell phone rings. She takes it out, looks at the caller ID, and answers. Yes? Exterior, front gate. Two police officers in uniform, Officer Bud, 50, and Officer Lou, 25, stand on two two-wheeled Segway machines. They show their badges all around to a video camera that might be anywhere. Officer Lou wears a backpack. <laughs> 
Officer Bud is bent over, speaking to the gate's phone, since he's on, still on a Segway and the mouthpiece is at car driver level. Neither officer gets off his Segway. Hi, Mrs. Blackstone. Officers John Bud and Officer Key Lu. Police Department, we have an appointment. Follow up to your robbery yesterday? Yes, of course. I'm just stepping out of the shower and there's no one else home. I'll bring you in and be right down. The gate slowly opens. The cops wheel in. The gate closes just before Casey gets there. Casey sits and watches them go. Exterior front door. Hidden in some bushes, Emmett sees the two Segway cops rolling up the walk towards the front door. Interior Zach's better bookcase. Mrs. B reopens the fake books, grabs a large plastic bag of white powder, and disappears into the bathroom. Beat. Sound off screen. Rustle, rustle, rustle. The toilet flushes, flushes again. Interior, Mrs. B's bedroom. Mrs. B hurries in, opens a drawer, takes out a gold jewelry box, and places it open on the dresser top. Exterior, front door. The Segway cops, still on their Segways, wait. Exterior, rear of house. Mrs. B bursts out of the kitchen's back door and heads towards the guest house, unlocks the door, enters, closes the door behind her. Emmett comes running around from the front, heads for the rear kitchen door, enters, and disappears inside. The guest house door opens. Mrs. B comes out, locks the door, runs for the kitchen's back door, and disappears inside. Interior, front door. Mrs. B opens the door, a touch winded. The two cops, still on their segways, flash their badges again. Hi, Mrs. Blackstone, Officer Bud. Officer Lou, we're about the rob. Yes, of course. Come in. The two officers get off their segways and casually tie their segways reins to a nearby railing, as in horse reins, but for a segway. Officer Bud enters. Officer Lou dismounts, but stays outside. Aren't you coming in? No, ma'am. I'm the outside man. He takes off his backpack. I'm fine, thanks. But she shuts the door. Sorry to bother you with this stuff, Mrs. Blackstone. How's the campaign going? Great intentions demand great sacrifices. Giving it my best shot. How can I help you, and what do you need? Just want to go over a couple of things before we get started, so we're all uh, on the, same, on the page. same page. Emmett listens on his hands and knees at the top of the front stairs. Casey arrives and places his red ball in front of Emmett and wags his tail. I understand, yes. The ring was worth a quarter of a million dollars? Yes, it was handed down from my great-grandmother. She was part of the court of the Tsar of... According to your statements, you also know who the single perpetrator is? Yes, I do. Correct. You stated it was Mrs. Camilla Suarez. And I still do. Carmela Suarez stole my ring. There's no doubt in my mind. Emmett hears this. Okay, well, this certainly makes our job a little easier. Okay, we've got to start something, so the scene of the crime is as good a place as any. Interior, second floor landing, front staircase. Mrs. B and Officer Bud come to the second floor landing. I woke up, went into the bathroom to take a shower. The bed was unmade. Five minutes later, I came out of the shower and into the room. My bed was made, the room was straightened, and the ring was gone. Emmett and Casey are gone. Exterior, backyard. Officer Lou walks alongside the house and comes to a rake lying in a freshly seated flower bed. He looks up and sees he's near the second floor bedroom balcony. Officer Lou takes off his backpack kneels next to the rake and takes a six-inch plastic bowl out of his pack. Interior, Mrs. B's second floor balcony. I told her I'd forgive her and not fire her if she returned the ring right then and there. She kept insisting she didn't take it. I called 911, she walked out, got in her car, and was gone. Where was your son at this point? In his room, asleep, at the other end of the hall. He was up all night helping with the campaign. Jake, look at this. Officer Lou, without his backpack, wears rubber gloves and has a rubber apron over his uniform. He holds a hardened epoxy impression of a shoe print in the dirt. Found it in the flower bed right below the balcony here. Pretty fresh. Could fit the time frame. Exterior backyard. The gardener, a short, slight-built Mexican, throws a big, full, black plastic leaf bag of leaves and plant cuttings onto the back of his truck bed, already half full of them. My gardener? The gardener signals, and the truck driver pulls slightly ahead to the next full black leaf bag on the ground. The process starts again with several more full bags ahead. Already tried a match. Wrong shoe size. But what's that look like to you? Interior of Mrs. B's bedroom. Officer Lou points to something in the middle of the epoxy shoe print casting. Abraham Lincoln on the penny in reverse. Interior of Mrs. B's closet. Emmett hears this and looks down at the guilty sneaker on his foot. Casey sits quietly beside it, holding his red ball firmly in mouth. Casey is totally into this animal hiding motionless thing. <laughs> Note, 
Casey never drops his red ball throughout this closet episode. Interior, Mrs. B's bedroom. Bud and Lou are checking out the epoxy shoe print mold. Around size 12. Gotta be a male. See? What I'm talking about. The downside of the good deed. Getting involved. Definitely a sneaker. Possible partner or solo perk. That day was February 12th. I was the prime suspect in a crime because of a hole in the bottom of my sneaker that looks like Abraham Lincoln. On his birthday. What are the chances? See what I'm saying? The omen. How else do you get into situations like this? This was not my fault. You can't make up a dog with a red ball, so I write it down. Proof. It's in my journal. The cell phone rings. Mrs. B answers hers. Hi, Sal. What's up? Okay, hold on. Sorry, gentlemen, the campaign. I'm going to take this in my office. I'll be right back. Go right ahead. Emmett watches from a slightly ajar closet door as Officer Bud glances around the room. The two officers casually stroll around the room, looking, touching, opening a drawer, a perfunctory poke, shutting it, moving on. All very casual and cursory. Officer Lou looks at the night table. Officer Bud looks at the open jewelry box on the dresser and stares at the mirrored closet door. Interior, closet. Emmett sees Officer Bud through the small slit of vision as he heads towards his closet. Interior, Mrs. B's bedroom. Officer Lou opens a large bottom drawer. Officer Bud grabs the doorknob to Emmett's closet door. Whoa! Hey, Lou! Look at this! Officer Lou is waving two dildos at him. Officer Bud runs to him, grabs him away, marches them back to the large bottom dresser drawer. You friggin' nuts, you're gonna get us suspended. Officer Bud sees what's in the drawer. Jeez. The drawer is full of dildos and vibrators of all colors and sizes. Both cops are preoccupied with the toys and their backs are to Emmett's closet and balcony. So Emmett steps quietly but normally out of the closet, out the open sliding glass door and onto the balcony. We watch, looking out the glass wall. Emmett peers down over the balcony railing. He gets up on the railing's edge, does a huge suicidal spread eagle swan dive out into the air and drops out of sight like a stone, but just before Officer Bud turns around to look at the spot where Emmett just was, but it's not now. We really don't have a warrant, do we? Exterior backyard below Mrs. B's bedroom. The gardener's truck with its truck bed full of plastic bags of leaves, etc., is parked directly below Mrs. B's balcony. Emmett lays spread eagle on his stomach and face, safely amidst the truck bed's big, leaf-stuffed bags of leaves and cuttings. The truck starts up. Casey watches wistfully through the window from inside the house as the truck leaf bags into Emmett drive out the front gate. Interior, second floor hallway. Mrs. B comes upstairs, walks to her bedroom, and enters. Interior, Mrs. B's bedroom. Officer Bud and Lou just stand innocently with smirks on their faces. Sorry, teleprompter problems. It's always something. No problem. We pretty much think we have the modus operandi. Carmelo wrapped the ring in some sort of heavy protective cloth, maybe a hand towel, threw it to a confederate on the ground, who then left when the opportunity presented itself. Sounds plausible. We were wondering if you'd be available Monday for a press conference. Around noon? Four. We phoned the chief and he thinks we can kill a lot of birds with one stone here. The department's budget is coming up for a vote on Thursday. We'd like to call a press conference Monday where we name your suspect as the perp, declare her a fugitive, and get on with stage two, pursuit and capture. To announce that much progress in a high-profile candidate's case that quickly to the public in a press conference three days before the vote, minimum it would give the rank and file of major boost. Sounds great. Glad to help. Of course I'll be there. Great. Thank you very much. The chief and the guys, they'll really appreciate it. You just left it laying here? He indicates the spot next to the clock on the night till by the bed. No, no, no. That's what I wanted to tell you. Before getting in bed, I locked it in the jewelry box. She indicates the open jewelry box on the dresser top. Officer Bud's brow furrows and he reaches for his smartphone. I even remember thinking, Carmela has only been working here two or three days and you never know. Excuse me, Mrs. Blackstone. I believe you told us over the phone the ring was on the night table next to the clock right before I got out of bed and went to take a shower. That transcribed from a recording. Of course, because that's what I said at the time, and I was speaking out of habit. I always put this one on my night table before falling asleep. 
It's my late husband's ring. I place it next to me on the nightstand when I go to bed. I simply misspoke out of habit, and I'm running a campaign for city council, as you might have noticed, so I don't know if I'm coming or going from one minute to the next, but really, I know I put it in that jewelry box under lock and key before going to sleep that night. Where did she get a key? This morning, I finally made the connection to something that happened two days before the robbery. Three days ago, my spare key to that jewelry box went missing, just disappeared, and Carmela said it would probably turn up when she cleaned, and it did. The next day, she found it, but... But she could have had it copied during the time it was missing. Would you mind if we searched Carmela's room? Not at all. Of course. Would either of you like some fruit? It's organic. No, thanks. No, thanks. And your son's room? Really? Why? Procedure. Just to cross the T's and dot the I's. Is there a problem? Oh, no. Sorry if I gave you that impression. Just want to know what's going on, of course. Uh, you know, actually, I haven't been in the guest house since she moved in. Why don't we start there? Whatever's easiest, ma'am. Exterior, Venice Boardwalk, day. I don't know if most of what happened actually happened. What's that supposed to mean? Carmela, Rusty, Dee, and Nat have gathered to hear Emmett's report. I don't know if I really was trapped in Zach's mom's bedroom closet with a little black dog with a little red ball and forced to watch two cops sword fight with a thousand dildos of all nations. I assumed I was having an acid flashback and just sort of went with it. What about any news? Good news or not so good news? Uh, good news first. Carmela, you're not the prime suspect anymore. Wow, that's great news. What's the not-so-good news? The prime perp is me. No way. Yes way. I left a footprint in the flower bed last night. Damn it. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. The sneaker with the Abe Lincoln hole? Oh, no, Emmett. You should have waited. I could have gone with you tonight. Damn it. You still can. What do you mean? I'm going back tonight. Why? Because, what's his name? He painted the, the woman surfer on the side of Harry's apartment building. Danny O. Uh, when I left Zach's house, I hitched a ride on the gardener's truck to get out the front gate. So? I left Danny's ladder there. It's hidden, but... The one with his name on it? And he just booked another wall. He's fucked without it. I, I gotta go back and get it. Damn it. They have your shoe print. Exactly. They also have the wrong woman and the wrong man. I think we should call a lawyer. Nothing quickens the blood like the doubt of a beautiful woman. Damn it. It's a crime scene, and you're the prime perp. Nothing focuses the mind like the hangman's noose. I get it. Nat, you want to come? Nah, I'm fine. Thanks. You said you didn't want to get involved. That was before I got involved. Emmett, I really appreciate what you're trying to do, but you don't... There is no try. There is either do or not do. God damn it, Emmett! At least change your shoes. It's my only pair. Carmela, you better be innocent. Emmett, seriously. Okay, one shoe. That shoe. The shoe. No, see, that's the point. This is my only pair of shoes. Carmela and I are both innocent till proven guilty. And we're both innocent of these charges. No, Emmett. You're breaking and entering a private residence that contains a crime scene while wearing extremely incriminating evidence that ties you to the crime scene. You're guilty until proven innocent. I'm breaking and entering for the greater good. You're breaking and entering because you're fucking crazy, dude. Exactly. Agreed. So we're all on the same page. The difference is, I'm fine with it. From where I am, it's not a problem. You in or out? Interior, the guest house, Carmela's living quarters. A nicely framed picture of Carmela and her son in a graduation gown crashes to the floor, shattering the glass. Clothing is thrown on top of it. A pillow hits the pile. Officer Lou is just finishing ransacking the place. Clothes and books and personal stuff is thrown all over the place. It looks like a bomb went off in here. Officer Bud dumps over the mattress, finds a tiny gold key. Ma'am, you recognize this? Oh my god, that looks exactly like the key to my jewelry box. You were right, it's her. Oh, that's so sad. Poor woman. Officer Bud photographs it, deftly puts on a rubber glove, picks up the key, drops it in the envelope, seals it, and pockets it. Proof. Corroborating evidence. The cell phone rings. Officer Lou answers. Yeah. Say again? Got it. APB on Burgundy and Strathmore. We gotta roll. Sorry, ma'am. Emergency call. We know the way out. Don't worry. We'll get your ring back. That's a promise. You get some rest, Mrs. Blackstone. We'll take care of this. They leave Mrs. B standing in the ransacked guest house. Exterior, Mrs. B's front gate entrance day. 
As the two Segway cops roll out of the front gate, Casey runs towards the gate that's closing behind them. Will he make it? He makes it. Casey runs just a safe distance, turns, calmly sits and watches the two Segway cops roll away hastily in the opposite direction. Crossfade to exterior, Mrs. B's street, night. Emmett rides his bike down the street, approaching Mrs. B's house. Suddenly, he sees Casey sniffing around the neighborhood mansion's front lawn. Casey? Casey stops, stares, his tail starts wagging. Stay. Sit. Casey obeys, his tail in full wag. As Emmett approaches, he pulls out the plastic baggie with the rest of the hot dog in it. He tosses a piece to Casey, who catches it midair, still seated and wagging. Emmett sits on the lawn next to him, looks around. What's it like living around here? I couldn't handle it. There's too much gear here. He smells something not good. He turns on his flashlight to Casey, who's proudly just left a nice big dog dump on this Bel Air home's green grassy front lawn. Casey, all that came out of just you? I certainly hope you're through. Suddenly the front lawn is flooded with light. An unseen public address system blares off screen, seemingly from all directions. You'd better clean that up or I'm calling the cops. Emmett and Casey look around, but the light is blinding. Why don't you get a job? Emmett looks down at the dog shit in the bright light and smiles. Close up, Mrs. Blackstone's diamond and ruby heirloom ring is sparklingly embedded in Casey's dark brown poop. Wow, Case, you really don't like her. Emmett immediately takes out his clear plastic sandwich baggie, takes out the rest of the hot dog, gives it to Casey. Thanks, bro. He turns the baggie inside out, back over his hand, expertly picks up Casey's dog droppings, ring it all in one scoop, stands into the light. This is my job! And, as triumphant music builds, holds the baggie of dog shit and great grandma's diamond ring over his head like one of those two black glove fists uh, held up at the Olympics back in the day. Hand high, head bowed, in the bright, blinding light and triumphant music. Exterior, Venice Beach, night. The boardwalk is shut down, mostly lit by streetlights. On the beach, four figures stand around the fire in a, ba in a garbage can. Rusty's hand and Mrs. B's diamond ring on one finger, all cleaned up and sparkling in the firelight. She takes it off and passes it to D. She, D, Emmett, and Skye, a Rasta beach drummer, 26, stand around the fire examining how cool the ring is. Casey the dog is still with them. How much is it worth? A quarter of a million. <clears throat> Damn. Now what? We turn the dog and the ring in. Hopefully, Mrs. B throws us a couple of bucks for thanks. And you never what, know. what's our story? What do you mean? What happened? How'd you get the ring? The dog ate the ring. He ran away, I found him, fed him, he took a dump, I found the ring. I'm returning the ring and the dog. Carmela and me are innocent, that's our story. It sounds like the dog ate your homework. You turn that ring in, you're doing timey. I found the ring in a pile of dog shit. I'm innocent of the current charges. That's the truth, that's what I'm saying. Emmett, you don't have any money. There's your motive right there. And if you don't have any money, the only reason you don't have any money is because you're a lazy, addicted pariah. You have no permanent address, no cell phone, you dress weird, you look like a stranger. I'm innocent, I found it in the dog shit story, is dog shit lame. They found your Lincoln penny shoe print at the scene of the crime. You have the ring in your possession, you're wearing the Lincoln shoe, you're not from around here. You stole the ring. Simple and under 124 letters. See, that way you go to jail. And the nagging citizens babble go on to be a barrel roar and the head haunches can go back to working on their boats and mortgages. You're a crazy homeless thief and publicity seeking con artist, bro. You turn it in, you're going down, Essie. I'll give it to her son. Zach's an uncooled drug mule. How do you know? I just do. He just does. Leave Casey and a package with the ring inside with the neighbor. And please, lose the shoes. Exterior, Venice Boardwalk, Delivery Alley, day. Close up. Cool new red sneakers walk down the alley towards the door with Eddie's van parked in front. Eddie, the van driver in Zach's first scene, walks down the breezeway alley wearing the red sneakers. One side is apartment garages and the rear of apartment buildings. The other side is lined with the rear of apartment buildings and business delivery entrances for stores along the boardwalk. Eddie's van is parked in front of the door of an alley apartment further down the alley. Interior, Eddie's apartment, day. Insert, close up. Smartphone screen showing a YouTube video of a black and white liquor store surveillance video of two Halloween masked males robbing a liquor store with no sound. 
Chooch sits on the couch watching this on a smartphone with earbuds on in a cheap ground floor Venice apartment living room off the alley. Another door goes off to another room, probably the kitchen. Sound off screen, a key in a lock, and the door opens and shuts. Holy shit. Hey, E, we've gone viral, dude. What are you talking about? The owner of that market we held up put our robbery on YouTube. He's offering $630 for information leading to our capture. He added cartoon music and we got a million hits so far. Check it out. He shows Eddie. On the smartphone screen, market security camera, YouTube post. The sound has been taken off and cartoon music has been added with cartoon sound effects. The video picture is in real time. The camera is centered, looking down the aisle, foreground, below the camera, looking away down the aisle at the top of the frame. A Halloween mask robber, gun in hand, is seen backing into the frame. He backs into a display, knocking it over. Falls, hitting his head against the refrigerator cases. He's groggy on the floor and on his hands and knees. Suddenly, a short, frail, little old Syrian grandmother wearing the traditional scarf over her head and garb, carrying a big shopping bag in one hand, hobbles over and starts beating him on the back with the cane in her other hand as he crawls away up the aisle. Suddenly, another Halloween mask robber, gun in hand, enters the bottom frame, comes up behind her, and firmly, with his free hand, grabs her by the back of her coat collar and slowly pulls her backwards back out of the bottom of the frame while she still swings at the robber on the floor, escaping on his hands and knees at the other end. He stands and runs out, leaving nobody in frame. The second robber strolls in from the bottom of the frame, his back to us, tucking his gun into the back of his pants, shaking his head in dismay as he walks away. He stops and slowly turns as the little old Syrian grandmother hobbles into frame back to us, following him, waving her cane, seeming to be chastising the robber looks like he's saying, okay, okay, I'm leaving, I'm leaving, okay, okay, jeez. Then he turns his back to her and shaking his head like, she's nuts, I'm out of here. He exits the same way his buddy did. The title card comes on, $630 reward. Gee, oh, fuck. For information leading to our arrest. Okay, dude. It's not a good thing, a-hole. Yeah, yeah, the, the money's an insult, but come on. The mask stayed on. It's funny. I watched it 25 times. We get over 2 million hits, he's got to pay us. You're a complete jerk-off, you know that? It's a joke. What the fuck, man? Chill, dog. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, dude. Cell phone rings. Teddy answers. Hey, Z, what's up? Dude, slow down. What's that? What are you talking about? What? Zach, don't tell me this. Z. Fuck. Now what? He came home early. The merchandise is gone. Okay, okay, just calm down. What happened? Dude, what the fuck? Where'd she go? Okay, okay, just shut the fuck up and calm down. I'm gonna see if I can work it out at my end. I'll call you back. Just sit tight. Don't go nowhere. Calm down. His fucking maid skipped with our stash and his mom's diamond ring. He's gone. The diamond ring is gone. The stash is gone. Eddie opens a drawer, takes out his handgun, and sticks it behind his back in his pants belt. Bullshit. He stole the stash, period. I knew it. I told you. The kid's not cool. This was a setup. Hey, whatever. Picks up his keys to the van, etc. Whatever, dude. Max is gonna break our friggin' legs, dude. Cut off our kneecaps. That's another thing. You don't fucking listen. But don't worry. Not happening. How are we gonna replace that much merchandise? We are not. However, Mrs. Blackstone is going to give us enough money to replace it in return for her dear little son, Zack, back. Alive. In one piece. Chooch picks up his handgun from another couch pillow and sticks it behind his back. Sounds like a plan, my man. They head out. Exterior, Mrs. B's front gate, Dave. Eddie is waiting on his cell phone and standing in front of an ivy-covered wall. He's about 50 or more feet away from the front gate of Mrs. Blackstone's mansion and the gate's speakerphone standing with his back to it. Hey, Zach. Eddie. Okay. All fixed. It's cool. I saved our asses. It's all good. They let me put in on my books. They trust me. Exactly. Okay. So, onward. Turns out they got some new action and I got a sample. It's incredible. Great. Actually, I'm just passing your house right now. Exterior, Mrs. B's neighborhood travels continuous. 
Close up, Emmett's sneakers pedal his bicycle. Emmett checks out the houses, walls, and gates he's passing. Casey is in the rear basket, front paws up on the basket side, facing ahead into the breeze. Exterior, down the block from Mrs. B's home, continuous. Robbie, Zach's 10-year-old neighborhood skateboarder, is sitting on the curb, retying his shoelaces and checking his skateboard's rear wheels. Emmett pulls up. Hi, uh, cool sneaks. Robbie is wearing cool sneakers. Thanks. You live around here? I think that guy's got a gun. Who? Robbie's actually looking past Emmett to the scene way behind him down the street. Eddie and Zach are standing in front of Zach's gate. Eddie is waving at Eddie's van, parked about 500 feet further down the street, and parked on the wrong side, facing in Emmett and Robbie's direction. But it doesn't move. Eddie's other hand has been continuously stuck in Zach's back. You see that guy with Zach? Which one's Zach? The guy in front. Eddie raises and flails his gun hand at the van in impatience, then replaces it in Zach's back. That thing in the other guy's right hand? Yeah. You sure? Uh-huh. We should call 911. No, wait, no police. Why not? Zach's an uncool drug mule. How do you know? I just do. Exterior, van. Zach is forced to sit between Chooch and Eddie. The van pulls away, headed towards Emmett and Robbie. Exterior, down the block. Let me the skateboard. You can hold Betsy and Casey till I get back. You're crazy, mister. Really, that guy has a gun. Yeah, but I gotta talk to Zach. It's okay. I'm invincible till at least midnight tonight. Go for it. Robbie hands him the skateboard as the van approaches. I'll be back. Interior van traveling street. Chooch sees Emmett safely on the side of the road, heels against the curb. Robbie and Casey seated on the curb. Suddenly, Emmett throws the skateboard down, hops on, and shoots across right in front of the van. Chooch hits the brakes. Emmett ducks down in front of him. The truck stops and stalls. What the fuck, fucking a-hole? He looks out the side window. No Emmett anywhere. Go! No clunk! You didn't hit him. Just go! 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 Exterior, curbside. Robbie and Casey hears the engine start. Watch the van pull away, revealing Emmett crouched down low on the skateboard, holding onto the rear bumper, hitching an unseen ride as the van rides away. Emmett waves as he coughs in the van's exhaust pipe. Exterior, Venice Beach Day. Officer Butt and Officer Lou stand on their sideways, eating fajitas at a parked food truck. They casually note Eddie's van drive past at legal speed, with Emmett crouched down on the skateboard, hitching a hidden ride onto the rear bumper. They give chase on their segways while quickly devouring their fajitas. Exterior, another street. The van drives past. Emmett still hunkered down on the skateboard and holding on to the rear bumper, coughing and woozy from the van's exhaust smoke and fumes. The van and Emmett drive past. The two cops on their segways speed past in hot pursuit. Emmett woozily sees them in pursuit, but hangs on. Exterior, street, traveling, continuous. The Segway cops are in hot pursuit. Exterior, street, day. The van comes around a corner, but doesn't see the stop sign, nearly hitting two pedestrians starting to cross. Chooch stops just in time, but the van stalls again. It gives the Segway cops time to come around the corner, way down at the other end of the street, and get them in sight again. The van pulls away around the corner, and then takes a quick, sharp left into an alley. The two cops on segways come around the corner, also ignoring the stop sign, nearly hitting the little old Syrian lady with a cane and shopping bag from Chooch's YouTube video, starting to cross from the other side of the street. Thus, the cops miss the alley and continue on down the street. The little old Syrian lady shakes her cane and curses after them, exactly like she cursed after the viral video themes. Exterior, alley, day. The van slows, and just before it stops, Emmett lets go of the rear bumper and hides behind a dumpster. The van stops in front of a first-floor alley apartment doorway. Eddie and Zach get out. Chooch covertly holds the gun to Zach while Eddie unlocks the apartment door, gets out, and unlocks the apartment door as Eddie brings Zach around inside at gunpoint. The apartment door closes and locks behind them. Emmett goes around the van's open driver's side window, reaches in and honks the horn three times, then disappears behind the van. Chooch opens the apartment door, gun in hand, peeks out to check the alley. Nobody around. He steps out, leaving the door directly behind him, slightly ajar. He warily goes to the open driver's window, checks the inside of the van, opens the door. Interior, van. Chooch checks. Nothing's been disturbed. Interior, Eddie's kitchen, continuous. Zach sits on a chair at the kitchen table, held at gunpoint by Eddie, who yells to Chooch outside. Yo, what's going on? Exterior, alley. Chooch shuts the van door. Auto key clicks the windows up and the door is locked. 
Nothing. Probably some friggin' kids. And goes back inside. Interior. Eddie's apartment. Front room. Day. Chooch re-enters, gun in hand, turns to peek back and check the alley one more time. Emmett steps out from behind the door, behind Chooch, and whacks him in the head from behind with the flat of the skateboard, breaking the skateboard. As Chooch falls, Emmett plucks the gun from his hand and nudges Chooch so he falls out into the alley. Interior, Eddie's kitchen, continuous. Zach sits on a chair at the kitchen table with Eddie and his gun. Hey Chooch, what the fuck did you break now? Chooch? Stay right there or I'll friggin' blow you away wherever else you are. He looks through the open door and out into the front room. He sees the front door is wide open. No chooch. Hey, chooch! Shut the friggin' door! Pissed, he steps into the front room and is whacked over the head from the other side of the door by Chooch's gun butt in Emmett's hand. He collapses unconscious. Zach? Yes? You alone? Yes, I'm unarmed. Part of Emmett's head peeks out from behind the door frame at the bottom near the floor. He sees Zack alone and unarmed at the table. His head disappears. He enters, standing, gun still held by the barrel, ready to club another bad guy. Quickly, he picks up Eddie's gun and sticks it in his belt. Emmett warily enters the kitchen, even checking above the doorway on the kitchen side before entering. Zack sits very still. You okay? So far. What's going on? I'm being kidnapped because my mother's rich. Cool. I thought it was because you were an uncool drug mule. Who are you? Exactly. Exterior, the next street, day. The two Segway cops come around the corner and look at a street devoid of a van. Officer Bud's hand signals, stop. We've lost them on the last block. They roll back to the corner and go back the way they came. Exterior, previous street. Bud and Lou come out of the turret and slowly check driveways and garages. Sound, off screen. Two fingers in the mouth whistle from a distance. Way down the block, Emmett stands at the middle of Eddie's alley, giving the two officers the finger with both hands. As soon as the officers head their segways straight for the alley, Emmett darts back into the alley. Exterior alley, day. The cops on segways come around the corner of the alley. Waiting for them is Emmett, waving the finger from the apartment doorway of the parked van. The two cops segway up to the back of the van, hop off, tie their segway reins to the back door handle, pull their weapons, and warily approach the open door peek inside and enter. Interior, apartment day. Guns drawn, the two cops find Emmett and Zachary standing side by side, both showing empty hands. Chooch and Eddie's guns are in plain sight on the coffee table. Chambers open and empty, bullets displayed inside the guns. Eddie and Chooch are sitting on the floor, tied back to back with extension cords. They're just coming too. Officer Lou disappears into the kitchen, gun at the ready. Emmett and Zach stand open-handed and calm as Officer Bud holds them at gunpoint. I'm all ears, gentlemen. My name's Zachary Blackstone, officer. These two guys broke into my mom's house two days ago and stole my mom's diamond and ruby ring. And they came back today and kidnapped me for ransom. This guy captured them and saved my life. Bullshit. True shit. Officer Lou entered from the other room. The place is a drugstore. Bricks, pills, powder, plus... He holds up the two distinctive Halloween masks worn in Chooch's viral YouTube video. These two are the YouTube mini-market guys. Holy caboli! Bud, look at this! Officer Bud looks. Officer Lou holds his police smartphone screen next to the bottom of Eddie's foot. Eddie's wearing Emmett's sneakers. A large color photo of Officer Lou's casting of Emmett's shoe print and with the eight Lincoln shaped hole clearly featured and delineated matches perfectly to the bottom of the sneaker Eddie's wearing. Officer Bud immediately starts searching Eddie's pockets. He pulls out Mrs. Blackstone's diamond ring from Eddie's shirt pocket. Honest Abe doesn't lie. Emmett approaches Officer Bud. Hand out. Nice job. Well done, really. Thanks. Zach shakes Officer Lou's hand. Nice job. Well done. Congratulations. Congratulations. Emmett is wearing Eddie's red sneakers. Interior, Mrs. B's living room. On a large wall screen TV, Mrs. B is being interviewed on some local afternoon news show in her home. Let's talk about what it takes to run for and win a seat on the city council because you had some tough competition and I hear a robbery. 
That must have been a terrible distraction. Well, the police caught their man, or men, two young men, so sad. And I can't thank the police enough. The police are the men in blue, and they sure are. But it takes its toll. You just have to stay focused on the big picture and why you're doing it. Why are you doing it? I'd given my maid an extra key for safekeeping, and I guess I just had a blog moment because I completely forgot. We all had a big laugh about it. Water under the bridge, really. Carmela, wherever you are, I am so, so sorry. Love you. She waves into the camera and smiles. Mom, you framed an innocent person. The TV sound clicks off. Zack and Mrs. B have been watching the news on their wall TV. I also kept my own stupid, selfish flesh and blood from wasting five to ten years of his life in prison getting raped every time he takes a shower because he was selling heroin out of this house while his mother was running for city council. Are you out of your mind? I never bought or sold any drugs to anyone. No, spare ever. me. The truth is I probably kept hundreds of addicts alive for a few more days because they didn't have enough to overdose. Mom! Would you frame me? Where's Casey? I know you know. Would you? Don't push your luck, Zachary. Exterior, nice restaurant evening. At the Venice Beach Pier, Emmett, Carmela, Pablo, her son, 18, Rusty and Dee exit the restaurant, stand together in front, saying goodbyes. Carmela hugs Emmett goodbye. Thank you. You are very brave and kind. Not really. You said I could do it. I just hoped you knew what you were talking about. Rusty, you're a lifesaver. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Really. If you guys ever needed a lawyer, let me know. You got one. You never know, so it's nice to know. The group does their goodbye hugs, and Rusty, D, Carmela, and Pablo head inland. Emmett heads down the cement path along the beach, wearing his red sneakers. The restaurant tab plus tip was 150 bucks. So where did the money come from? Turns out Eddie and Chooch robbed a mini market about a month ago, and the owner was offering a $630 reward for info leading to their arrest. The two Segway cops vouched for me, so I qualified. Exterior, riding Emmett's bike, traveling, a nice day. Emmett rides his bike on the bike path on Venice Beach boardwalk with Rusty standing behind on the rear wheel's extended axle straddling the back wheel. He's got on the red sneakers. They ride in silence, taking in Venice Beach and the people. I gave Carmela and Pablo 150 apiece, which left me 230 bucks to go to the Salvation Army and pick up a couple of blankets, flannel shirts, canned goods, and fresh veggies for Maurice, Marsha, at the hat and me. You know what the big win of the whole thing is? No. Um, what? Eddie and me have the exact same shoe size. 164 bucks. I googled it. Interior, Pablo's Venice apartment day. Pablo and Carmela watch TV. Casey is asleep in Carmela's lap. Exterior, riding Emmett's bike, traveling. A nice day. A beach bum on an old bicycle loaded with a lot of his stuff, Lenny, 65, pulls alongside and rides with Emmett and Rusty. Hey, E, heard you got some criminals. That true? Yeah, two. They had guns and he didn't. Big time, drug selling, jewel thieving, kidnapping ransomers. Wow, you get any kind of reward? Almost $700. Whoa, nice. Blew it all in Vegas, baby. It was a blast. That's the way to do it. Somebody's got to. Damn it, you're so crazy. Crazy, invincible. But it comes and it goes. You never, you know. As end credits roll, optional for an under credit roll, interior Mrs. B's bedroom early morning. Mrs. B opens her eyes and wakes up. On the night table beside her head is a lamp, a clock, 7 a.m., a half-eaten cupcake, and the diamond ruby ring. The woman looks at the clock, gets out of bed, puts on a robe, opens the drapes, goes into the bathroom, turns on the shower, and closes the door. Casey trots into the room, jumps on the bed, goes over to the night table, and eats and laps up the pieces of the cupcake, its crumbs and the diamond ring all together, hops off the bed and exits the bed feet. Carmela comes in and starts making the bed, finishes, wipes off the nightstand of the bits of cupcake crumbs Casey left, and then leaves the room. Beat. Mrs. B comes in out of the bathroom, etc. Credits end.